Christy Shriver, and we're here to discuss books that have changed the world and have changed us. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Lit podcast. I have to tell you that I am very excited about this series, maybe uh, more than any series we have ever done. It's finally time. (laughs) The Great Gatsby. He has been excited. It is probably the most notable of all American novels. Uh, It's so short. It's so beloved, sometimes hated, and I'm very interested in how uh, this conversation is going to evolve. Uh, And you, Christy, I know you have a lot you want to say about this fairly short book. Well, that's true. It's probably my favorite book to teach out of all the books I teach, but it's not just me. This book is the gem that keeps on giving. English teachers, as lots of you know, love mining books for hidden meanings and symbols and all those things that students think that we make up. In fact, (laughs) I have (laughs) students read critical articles just to dispel the belief that I'm making it up as I go. (laughs) (laughs) Well, as far as all that goes, are you suggesting that English teachers don't believe a cigar is just a cigar, you know, to use a Freudian <laughs> reference. Right, we don't. That's it exactly. English teachers love looking for the subtext of things. What is the author saying through the details, metaphorical, literal? What is he or she wanting to suggest or what direction or opinion are they is the author nudging us towards that we may not even realize? In Gatsby's case, there is so much that Fitzgerald is commenting on in so few words. Some of it is obvious, like the idea of repeating the past. Some of it's subtextual, the criticism of America's obsession with wealth. A lot of it is ironic and counterintuitive, like the American ethos of striving and its value. But why are we entertained by all of this? There's just a lot here that we like. Never mind the fact that even today, no matter what we say, we are no less obsessed with wealth than we were in the 20s. It's seductive. This book is short, glamorous, fun to read. (laughs) So see how deep we can go. The thing about Fitzgerald is that He's kind of like William Blake, really. He's a visionary. If if you listen to that episode, you know what I mean when Blake uses that word. Fitzgerald sees things, sees visions. He sees the world. To use another Blake term, he imagines the world. And he describes for us what he sees in his mind with color, with sounds, with pictures. Every single page of this book was written and rewritten. When I went to college, and here's an aside, personal anecdote, I had this writing teacher that really impacted my life. His name was Dr. Johnny Wink. That sounds like a character from a (laughs) Netflix series. Well, he would wear these old t-shirts. He had the long 1970s hair, everything you would think of a cliched English teacher. And Dr. Wink would say some things over and over and over again that would never will never leave my mind and one of those lines that he just hammered away at was good writing is not written it is rewritten and dr wink would challenge the myth that anyone could just sit down and create something magical off the cuff he taught us that the most effortless phrases had been written and written and revised and revisited many, many times until the author found them to be natural appearing and effortless and spontaneous. And this, of course, was the great trick, the sleight of hand, because they don't look that way. We saw that for sure with Jane Austen and her multiple revisions of Emma, but Even if you work hard, and lots of people do, it's not just the hard work. It's only the artist that has the ear and the imagination to make it work, to create the greatness. Oh, it's the same way with guitar playing, right? (laughs) Well, I I think maybe it is. (laughs) Well, and I have one other question. What was Dr. Johnny Wink's nickname for you? Oh, he used to call me Frog. You knew that. (laughs) (laughs) Just thought we'd bring that out. Well, back to Fitzgerald. When we read The Great Gatsby, it is masterfully written, and it is. This is not something you can contest. 
because it was rewritten sometimes as many as 75 times a page. Every page really could be analyzed as a poem. I'm not exaggerating about that. The sounds, the images, the insights, it's compact. And honestly, I really believe that it's the poetry that attracts people, not really the plot. I mean, which is surprising because there is murder, there's adultery, there's gangsters, there's lots of twists, but the plot is cliche. He borrowed a lot of it from that noir crime fiction kind of stuff. It's a backdrop, really. And even though I have to tell you that most of my students show up saying they hate poetry, they will find this book striking and seductive. And I believe it's because of the poetic feel to it. The colors, the sounds, the symbols, they're just magical, especially when you understand what you're reading. Well, and and don't forget my favorite, the irony. um, Almost everything is the opposite of what it claims to be. Well, that's absolutely true. And it's also what makes this book so funny. And it is funny. There's this dry, sarcastic humor. It's very American. It's very modern. There's this element of surrealism the haze, the impressions. Anyway, you can see that there's a lot going on uh, and we'll never get through all of it. I I couldn't possibly. And I do want to do justice to what I consider to be one of America's greatest masterpieces. And it is almost without debate one of the most technically perfect books ever written in America. So no more personal anecdotes. (laughs) Let's just jump in to a little context. And I know we don't have time to get into a lot, but tell us about the era, the real people, because this book is based on a lot of that. Uh, Yeah. Well, the first thing to say is we're talking about the jazz age. Uh, Fitzgerald, by the way, is credited for even creating that term. Uh, To use his words in Echoes of the Jazz Age, he says this, um, it was an age of miracles. It was an age of art. It was an age of excess, and it was an age of satire. And, it, I mean, it really was. Uh, it's the period of American history that starts after World War One and ends with the crash of the stock market in 1929. And um, it'll f- forever be remembered uh, by this incredible art form, jazz, that is also a, a constant presence in The Great Gatsby. Well, jazz really is, strangely enough. It's never directly referenced, but the music is so obvious through the musical instruments used, many other inferences that you won't find a Great Gatsby movie that doesn't try to incorporate jazz almost from start to finish. And jazz was not without controversy in the 1920s. And uh, although this book isn't about race, uh, it seems everything American indirectly has racial undertones, including this book. And jazz music is playing a part of that here. Jazz is an African-American art form, and it's the only original American art form of music. Wow. By the way, as you'll see in the first chapter, Fitzgerald, although by today's standards would not likely be considered progressive for his time, he really was extremely progressive, especially when it comes to things like racial thinking and other you know, contemporary concerns. He really pokes fun, among other things, at people who adhere to these concepts of white supremacy and the inclusion of jazz, like everything else, is not something to blow past. Nothing in this novel is decorative. Everything, every color, every symbol, every adjective is thematically intended. And by that, do you mean everything? I mean everything. Okay. Well, uh, I'll unleash you on all that symbolism, but uh, I've got some more uh, context goodies I want to squeeze in before uh, we get into all that. And if I can, uh, get a little English lit for a second. (laughs) Getting out of my waters here. Uh, The concept of jazz is reflected even in this narrative technique. Uh, Jazz music is about improvisation, uh, chord substitution, orchestration, complexity, um, and there has to be a groove to it. And uh, it's a fusion of of contrary impulses of modernism and, and classical music. I and mean, it was something for the poor and it was also something for the rich and for the black as well as the white. And 
Uh, this is the age of the Harlem Renaissance, which we've talked about before during our discussions of Langston Hughes. And it's the age uh, where we cast off religion for religion's sake and where we challenge the, the status quo in terms of women's issues and what we should talk about. And the constant tension of the 1920s was modern versus traditional. Well, what do we have to say about the ladies here? <laughs> Well, this is the era of the flapper, the the flamboyant uh, style of dress that, that really symbolized kind of progressive attitudes of women towards work and sex and gender roles and, and other things. And uh, this is the age of prohibition and speakeasies. There was a restlessness in the world after World War I, and America was not exempt from it. Everyone had been disillusioned by the pointlessness uh, and the personal cost of the war. And uh, this created a rejection of religious understanding. And to a large degree, that was exemplified by the Scopes monkey trial. Uh, but we also see it in the lives and in the writings of the greatest poets at the time, you know, not just the American ones. And there's a lot of obvious uh, corruption during this time, especially in the big cities like New York and Chicago. Uh, politicians were in on it. The cops were in on it. The, the character in the book, uh, Fitzgerald calls Myra Wolfsheim, actually is based in large part, but not entirely on a man by the name of Arnold Rothstein in real life, who literally had a monopoly on prostitution and gambling in the city of New York. I mean, Rothstein literally did raise money to pay players to throw the World Series in 1919, uh, but he made his big money in the bond business, and that may sound a little familiar if you finished reading the novel. And the whole decade was really an this unrelenting tension between old ways, traditional mores, modern, very different approaches to life, and as I read this book, I see that Fitzgerald really expresses all of these elements. And uh, this is the era where the gangster is stylish, a dandy, to use a slang term from the 20s. <laughs> dandy. A dandy. Uh dandy. It was in the 20s that uh, America really turned into the land of consumerism. And that hasn't changed much, really, to be honest. But <laughs> No. But it was in this decade that the credit economy came along, and that was new in the 20s. And all of a sudden, I mean, that unleashed an economic force unlike anything we'd ever seen before. And uh, there's a myriad of new products and aggressive advertising and upward mobility uh, on a scale that would have spooked in a wood house, <laughs> if we can draw in Regency England this and uh, as you know, I like to say writer is absolutely right from their experience. And uh, no one that we've read yet, at least to me, expresses that more than F. Scott Fitzgerald. I mean, he's looking around his world and saying, oh, I'll put that new automobile here and I'll add a little speakeasy and a hydroplane over here and there and <laughs> on and on he went. There is a lot of technology and there is a lot really true from the his historical era that he just kind of drops in. But he doesn't just drop in elements of culture. He also uses his own life. Zelda and Ginevra, those were his two love interests in his personal life. And they're both a part of Daisy. Ginevra's dad, his first love, served as a muse for Tom Buchanan, the schmuck. And in some ways, Fitzgerald himself is Nick Carraway. We could go on and on, and I might a little bit later, but there's just yeah, a bit. I'm sure you will. <laughs> but, uh, well, the most obvious parallel is that uh, he shortened his own life, you know, really wasted his own talent by living the life that he described so well. And in some sense, he's his own cautionary tale. So if you can either be a good example or a horrible warning. <laughs> He certainly lived the Gatsby lifestyle, money, excess, lack of restraint, everything Americans are so cliche about. But at the time that he was actually drafting the novel, ironically, when, well, when he finished, by the time he finished the novel, he and Zelda were living the high life in the French Riviera, back and forth from Paris. And back then, Sunbathing was not yet, you know, the hot thing that it is now. So you could go to the Riviera, according to him, because it was cheap and basically deserted. He said it was like going to Palm Beach for July. I don't know what that was 
Palm Beach was like in July <laughs> back then, but apparently deserted. In case you're interested, Fitzgerald actually wrote most of the book in a rented villa on a lush hillside in a town called St. Raphael. He called it, and I'm going to quote him, a little red town built close to the sea with gay red-roofed houses and an air of repressed carnival about it. Repressed carnival? Uh, <laughs> I mean, you can just tell he's talking. No one talks like that. <laughs> uh, yeah, indeed. Uh, it, it's enchanting and luxurious. That little villa is a, a beautiful hotel where for around, you know, 500 to 1,000. You mean today it is? Yeah, today. Uh, you, for about 500 to uh, 1,000 euros, you can enjoy um, a wonderful week in paradise and uh, even though it seems uh, Fitzgerald never wrote while he was drunk, it was during this European phase where it appears he and Zelda let their drinking really get out of control. And uh, when I think of Fitzgerald, I think of just total drunk in this crazy party pictures of him and Zelda in Rome and Paris and New York. And there are so many stories like them dancing around or jumping into the fountain of the Plaza Hotel or riding on top of a taxi. And some of them are destructive, like breaking plates in a drunken fit in Paris with famous expatriates like Ernest Hemingway. Uh, there's a lot of that. In fact, when I think about Fitzgerald, that's the kind of stuff that I think of. But that wasn't where he started. His real life, just like Nick in the book, started in the Midwest. Fitzgerald was born in St. Paul, Minnesota on September 24th, 1896. Anna, my daughter, says he has the best birthday. (laughs) I guess she would since that's her birthday, except 102 years apart. True. But it's important because, well, not the date, but the place, because location is a thing in The Great Gatsby, and it's an important symbolic thing. Middle America means something, and really this is something that we all know. For those of you who live outside of the United States, just like every other country in the world, we have a huge cultural divide between big city people of the coasts and smaller town people of the middle of the country. Almost all humans on Earth understand this dynamic because every country kind of divided out like this. And if you listen to us for a while, you may know that Gary and I live in Memphis. And Memphis, we're in the middle of the... We're the middle people. New York, where the Great Gatsby, is set on the coast. Now, this is a generality, but it's one that holds true. And at least it's true for Fitzgerald. People that live on the coast consider themselves more sophisticated, more educated, more wealthy, and basically generally better in every way to those of us in the middle. (laughs) In America, if you're a real coastal snob, you refer to us as living in the flyover zone because the only thing we do is get in the way and you have to fly over middle America to get from L.A. to New York and back again. We're the heartland, the place where traditional values are important. They mean something. They're to be upheld. And I know these are all generalizations and I know there's traditional people everywhere. There are progressive people everywhere. And I'm not saying one is good and one is bad, but for the purposes of this discussion, we're going to have to stay with Fitzgerald's stereotypes. Well, he's depending on them. (laughs) Yeah, he is. All of the main characters in this novel are from the middle of the country. Nick, Daisy, Jordan, Tom, but most importantly, Gadsby. But The Great Gadsby is not just a symbolic novel. It's an ironic novel. Most everything in the novel is absolutely the opposite of what it appears to be, or really what it presents itself to be. And this is where we're going to get our head spinning. This is the thematic discussion that Fitzgerald is going to want to have with us. Well, I have one question. How many times do you have to read this book before you begin to detect that kind of stuff? You have to read the commentary, so you may never. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, but well, once you see it, then it's like really obvious. Okay. Well, uh, uh, let me go back to our snobbery talk for just a moment. <laughs> because even on the coast, 
There are levels of snobbery. Levels. We all have our levels. We all have our (laughs) level. Fitzgerald lived in a place uh, called Great Neck, New York, specifically this little village called the Villages of Kings Point. That's real life. Yeah. In in the book, he calls it West Egg. Uh, The next peninsula over is Sands Point. It only has about 2,700 residents to this day, and it's very posh. And The best 2,700 residents. <laughs> it has boasted residents like Harry Guggenheim and William Randolph Hearst, John Philip Sousa, and, of course, Perry Como. And, <laughs> uh, what I've always heard is that Gatsby is about the death of the American dream, uh, striving to be the kind of person you just described, people who made something of themselves, people who became famous, wealthy, and important. Uh, all things people are who live in places he's symbolizing with fancy villages in Long Island. I mean, are you going to disagree with that? No, but I'm not going to agree with it either. <laughs> and the reason is I'm not sure what that means. What is the American dream? And Why is it dead? And I know that's a conversation for a history class on another day, but is it a dream just for Americans? And if so, why would anyone else want to read this book? I think the word to use here is striving. I want you use that word and I want to revisit that word because that's going to be a concept that is harped on in the book. It's in the striving that this book appears to transcend its own cultural context. Americans do embody that, but all Americans do. Austin's age was called the age of improvements. But what Fitzgerald has to say about this basic urge to push forward is interesting. He will bookend his book with this idea of pushing back, of striving. So let's read the first four sentences But before we do, I do want to say one more thing. Try to enjoy the humor and don't let the dry irony offend you because he's going to say some ridiculous things and he means them ironically. He doesn't mean them. He means the opposite of them. There is a lot of this book that's supposed to make you laugh. And sometimes you laugh out loud, but if you were to ask other people or if other, I guess I should say, if someone was to ask you, why are you laughing? And you said what it was, it wouldn't be funny because the line isn't funny. It's the context of the line that makes it funny. Well, and I want to add this point before we go on to reading it. Um, the American dream is really a straw man that critics of American culture use to beat up American culture with. Yeah. And that's kind of what exactly what he's going to be doing. Yeah. Yeah, we could actually do a sentence by sentence discussion on all that kind of stuff. The the humor, the lines, the American dream. And there are people that would totally track with that. Did you know that this is another aside, but it's really interesting. There's a Broadway play called Gats. And it's eight hours long. (laughs) (laughs) That does count a dinner break and an intermission. They perform the entire book word for word. It's popular, too. Right before the pandemic started, they were charging $125 a ticket up in New York to go see it. So embrace the enthusiasm, embrace the irony, embrace the jabs at American culture and the American dream, and let's put on our snobbery. (laughs) (laughs) We're at a safe distance and get started. (laughs) Okay. In my younger, more vulnerable years, my father gave me some advice that I've been turning over in my mind ever since. Whenever you feel like criticizing anyone, he told me, just remember that all the people in this world haven't had the advantages that you've had. He didn't say any more, but we've always been unusually communicative in a reserved way, and I understood that he meant a great deal more than that. In consequence, I'm inclined to reserve all judgments a habit that has opened up many curious natures to me and also made me the victim of not a few veteran bores. The abnormal mind is quick to detect and attach itself to this quality when it appears in a normal person. And so it came about that in college, I was unjustly accused of being a politician because I was privy to the secret griefs of wild, unknown men. Most of the confidences were unsought, Frequently, I have feigned sleep, preoccupation, or hostile levity when I realize by some unmistakable sign 
that an intimate revelation was quivering on the horizon. We can see immediately we're in the first person. The narrator is Nick Carraway. Now, that comes out later. We didn't know his name after what you just read. But the names in this story carry symbolic meaning. Carraway, he gets carried away. It's a pun. <laughs> well, even I can catch that one. <laughs> well, I mean, physically, but he's going to get carried away in a lot of, of things and the way that he perceives the world. But the larger point that I want to make here, and don't mistake who this story is about. It feels like it should be about Gatsby because that's the title, The Great Gatsby. But honestly, it tells the story of two men, both from the Middle West. Their stories, however, will end very differently. The story claims, and we're going to see all this in the first few pages, that Nick is returning to the Middle West. Gatsby's not returning, and let me just spoil it right now, he dies, oh. <laughs> but Nick claims he turned out all right in the end, although I'm not sure Gatsby would agree with that. Well, you have to wonder, how is it okay that Gatsby died? Well, it's only okay if this is Nick's story. <laughs> <laughs> this is a detached perspective. It's not an affectionate one. You wouldn't say that affectionately about somebody you cared about. Nick, in some sense, is telling his own story, and Gatsby is an agent in that story. So, um, if Nick gets carried away, does the name Gatsby mean anything? I'm almost afraid to ask. <laughs> well, it does. I'm glad you asked. The word gat is a common slang term from the 1920s that means thug or criminal. But what we will learn about Nick right off the bat is that he's not reliable. We shouldn't always trust his opinions of things. Nick does not describe Gatsby as a thug, and that's saying something because Nick is pretty much a snob himself and not the kind of person to appreciate necessarily a person who earns his living by lying and cheating and murdering, which is exactly who Gatsby really is. Nick just blows past all of that. He's also kind of unaware of who he is. He makes you think that he's this poor, naive guy from the interior. But the details of his life reveal that that's not true at all. Nick is affluent. His family has a successful business. They're well established. Nick graduated from an Ivy League school. He works in the world of finance in New York City. He's blue-blooded in his own right. And that is a term we use here in the United States for our privileged class. He's not a gazillionaire like Tom Buchanan, but he's much wealthier than most of us. So we should be careful about how much we trust Nick's judgments. We can trust him for some things, but we shouldn't trust him for all things, although Fitzgerald does lead us to his own conclusions very, fairly often. I know I'm getting confusing, so let me show you how this works right here from what he says. Nick claims to be the kind of person who doesn't judge people. And so we take him on his word on that. But if we thought about it for the rest of the book, that's really all that he does. Until we get to the conclusion in the end that Gatsby is worth more than all the characters in the story, which is what Nick literally says in chapter 8. This book is absolutely all about judging people and how we misjudge them or we judge them with wrong criteria. We are going to join Nick, and judging these crazy people is going to obsess us from our very first encounter with their glamorous hideousness, starting in chapter one. But before we jump into Nick's perspective, Fitzgerald is going to give us the opportunity to catch Nick in his hypocrisy. Like you mean at the very next sentence where he says, He's a victim of people who are boring. I mean, I guess he is judging them. Well, he is, and that's mean. Calling people boring is what Emma Woodhouse said that got her in so much trouble. But look at the next sentence. He compliments himself, and then he says it's because he's slightly disingenuous that he gets accused of being a politician, which is exactly what he is doing. He's judgmental. He's political. He can be mean. Nick uses people. But really, kind of the way he phrases it is confusing. It can be, because right after that, Nick goes on to do something that I find very entertaining, and he does it the whole way through the book. 
Nick makes pronouncements. <laughs> All through the book, he has this tendency to just make these strong statements, these moral assertions. We call them maxims, and they're kind of quotable. He'll just make a statement like it's some universal truth that he's a lifelong guru in philosophy and made up, but he can't be. He's only 29 years old. <laughs> well, uh, Aristotle would say that uh, even though maxims or, or these quotable lines are a useful tool for public speakers— Young speakers shouldn't use them because they don't have the experience to back them up and make them sound believable. Well, that is, that's it exactly. And these aren't things that are necessarily like universal truths that should carry biblical weight. They're obviously prejudicial opinions that may or may not be true. Things privileged people think, so to speak. But they're kind of interesting. So here's the first one. And they're like, there's, so they just go all the way through the book. But here's the first one. He's going to say this. Intimate revelations of young men, or at least the terms in which they express them, are usually plagiaristic and marred by obvious suppression. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's funny, but you have to read it a couple of times to figure out what it means and why it, why it's even true. I mean, I knew a young man once who uh, went to uh, our local university, took his first philosophy class, and came over and told me all these deep and newly discovered uh, truths about life and love and uh, th that should change how all of us were looking at the world, and it should inform our thinking from here on out, except that they're plagiaristic. I mean, <laughs> things that everyone has always thought, and the, the rest of us uh, had heard when we went through school. And what's worse, uh, the way he was understanding them wasn't even right. His plagiarized insights were <laughs> most definitely marred. And, and here's a note to self. Anytime you think you have uncovered a new secret of the universe— <laughs> You need to assume that millions have made the same discovery before you. That is plagiaristic. You. Yes. You're not going to reinvent <laughs> But, things. you know, you know that's the entire college experience. I mean, no one has ever had as heartbreak as badly as the one you're just having at this particular moment. No one has ever felt this pain. Uh, we, we've seen it all. I mean, that's the entire growing up experience. We just go from level to level and... Uh, it's new to me, so it must be new to the world. <laughs> and, and the way that Fitzgerald says that is kind of funny. So here's the second one. It's a little less, actually, it's far less cynical. And this might be my favorite line in the whole book. He says this, reserving judgments is a matter of infinite hope. That one I like. I like the idea of giving hope by refusing to judge. This applies to students, friends, anyone. I don't have to judge or condemn for whatever flaw, mistake you have, bad decision. I can be hopeful, infinitely hopeful. It's a wonderful thought. And it is kind of the way you have to approach this introduction to Gatsby. These two maxims look like they should stand alone, but they're not. They're not disconnected and they both apply. Uh, well, they do, uh, and it is hopeful, but even this hopeful assertion isn't without a qualification, and that's the third in the connecting maxim. I mean, look at how he uh, juxtaposes hope itself with a final maxim. He says this, conduct may be founded on the hard rock or on the wet marshes, but after a certain point, I don't care what it's founded on. I mean, in other words, uh, the way you act may be because you've had certain advantages. You may have had certain disadvantages uh, that I can understand or forgive or, or whatever, but uh, that will only work for a while. I'll give you a pass on bad behavior and mistakes and flaws in your background uh, because you're special circumstances, but but that has a limit. Um, grace runs out, and at some point, it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, hard rock or wet marshes, after a while, I simply don't care. And your conduct is your conduct, and you either put up or shut up, as I like to say in <laughs> vernacular. Yes, we're just in a couple of paragraphs, and he's setting up this philo philosophical pretext for the rest of the book, which he's going to start. So let's keep reading. When I came back from the East last autumn, I felt that I wanted the world to be in uniform and at a sort of moral attention forever. I wanted no more riotous excursions with privileged glimpses into the human heart. Only Gatsby, the man who gives his name to this book, was exempt from my reaction. Gatsby, who represented everything for which I had an unaffected scorn. If personality is an unbroken series of successful gestures... Then there was something gorgeous about him, some heightened sensitivity to the promises of life, 
as if he were related to one of those intricate machines that register earthquakes 10,000 miles away. This responsiveness had nothing to do with that flabby impressionability which is dignified under the name of the creative temperament. It was an extraordinary gift for hope, a romantic readiness such as I have never found in any other person and of which it is not likely I shall ever find again. No, Gatsby turned out all right in the end. It is what preyed on Gatsby. What foul dust floated in the wake of his dreams that temporarily closed out my interest in the abortive sorrows and short-winded elations of men. It's interesting, and you really do need to kind of reread it over and over again like it were a piece of poetry. It's extremely poetic. And it's about hope, which is ironic because Nick is telling this story in retrospect. There is no hope. The story's over. There's no suspense. He left the Middle West, went back east. Now he's come back to the Middle West. Gatsby's fate is already sealed. And like I said, spoiler, you might as well know, Gatsby dies. <laughs> or if you've seen one one of the, what, 20 versions of Great Gatsby's in the films, you would know. I this. didn't know it, though, when I read the book for the first time, to be honest. But <laughs> And this is a novel about time. The clock is ticking. We already know what happens. There are over 450 references to time in the novel, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. It's one of the more important ideas in the whole book, and Gatsby trying to turn it back clocks will break uh but nick is aware of that as are we here from the beginning nick leaves the middle west the traditional value of his early life he's restless but before we even find that out we find out that he's come back and look at what he says i wanted the world to be in uniform and a sort of moral attention forever We're reintroducing morality, consistency. These are things that you're not going to see, ironically, in any of the rest of the book and these privileged people that he talks about. We learn a lot about Nick before we meet the man to whom he gives the name of the story. Gatsby represented to Nick everything Nick hates, and we said that already, but... What redeems Gatsby comes back to hope. Look at what he said, an extraordinary gift for hope, a romantic readiness. Gatsby was willing to believe in a dream. It's what Nick finds and describes beautifully and what has destroyed his hope, what has destroyed Gatsby, the agent of hope. What preyed on him was a foul dust. Pay attention to how Fitzgerald is going to play with that word. There's going to be dust all over this book. And look at it, because it has the power to close Carraway's hope in men. So in this introduction that we're opening the story with, we're going to see hope. We're going to see judgment. We're going to try to figure out what the heck is this destructive dust. This book has nine chapters. All but one of them are pretty much equal length. The story is not told in chronological order, interestingly enough. It's told like a movie reel. Fitzgerald is writing at a time, and everyone knows this, that the cinema is just getting started. So this book is supposed to feel like a cinematic movie. It's a, I guess we would call it a cinematic style. Every single chapter is kind of like one scene. The scenes link, but they don't always link in chronological order. Chapter one or scene one is at Daisy's house in East Egg. And basically there's a party in every scene too. Chapter two, we can think of it as scene two. It's going to go through the Valley of Ashes and there's going to be a party in downtown Manhattan. Chapter three is going to be at Gadsby's mansion and there's going to be a party there. And we're going to see descriptions alternate between this wide angle panoramic shot, like at the big party shot. And then we're going to get into a close up. And you just have to roll with it. It's hard sometimes to, you know, connect all the dots. At the end of the second chapter, Fitzgerald is going to try to recreate the sensation of being drunk in the head of the reader. And then all of a sudden you wake up, you're at the metro stop, and you're not really sure how you got there. Uh, But in chapter one, we're going to take a tour of heaven, the white palaces of fashionable East Egg. Well... 
For those of us who really want to visualize what this looks like, we're going to put some links of places where you can go to really get some visuals. And uh, there have been so many people that have fleshed this out, but I wanted to try to draw a picture for your mind, especially if you don't live in the northeast of the United States. And so Long Island is this very long island that runs parallel to the state of Connecticut. It's full of little towns and suburbs, but uh, towards the end, where the island kind of touches the mainland of the United States, that's where you find Manhattan. So East Egg is kind of uh, farther up Long Island and West Egg. And today, if you Google map it, uh, by train it takes about two hours to get from East Egg to Manhattan. And uh, you'd have to go right through West Egg. And they're about nine miles away from each other, and they both kind of jet out into the bay. It is funny that he calls them eggs and tries to get you to visualize them from the sky. But they're a world of way in terms of culture from each other. Apparently, that's how Nick perceives them. And we're going to be introduced this when we get to Daisy's house. So Daisy's house, inside Daisy's house, everything is white and gold and red. So you say, what does that mean? Well, it means everything because everything is a symbol. Should we brace ourselves <laughs> for symbolism? Yes. The girls wear white dresses. The windows are glowing now with reflected gold. The crimson rooms are flooded with light. And take this away for the remainder of the book. He's using the colors archetypally. Sometimes it doesn't even make sense because they don't describe something that could have a color. Uh, We've talked about archetypes in other stories. Sometimes they're used, well, they're always traditional ancient symbols that transcend American symbolism or any kind of one country symbolism. White, for example, archetypally is the color of purity. Gold archetypally represents prestige and wealth and knowledge. Red, that's a little bit more interesting, but it often represents love, sacrifice, passion, although it can also represent anger and sin. But here's the kicker, and this is what I want you to think about. Fitzgerald is going to take all these archetypes and suggest that this is what people are portraying, but they're actually the opposite of these things. Daisy appears to be innocent and pure, but she's actually not. Tom acts like he's wise, wealthy, and prestigious. He has gold hair, but he's not. He, they present an image of love and sacrifice in their house, but none of this is true. We're going to understand that this book is really about the opposite of that. Gold represents corruption. White represents false purity. This is not a book about love. When Daisy describes her and Jordan's childhood in Louisville, Kentucky, she describes it as, our white girlhood was passed together there, our beautiful white childhood. Well, we're not supposed to understand that in racial terms. She means that her childhood was innocent. But of course, later on, we're going to see that it was far from innocent. And Jordan Baker is not innocent at all. It's false purity. This cheerful red and white Georgian colonial mansion overlooking the bay is not cheerful for one moment. And it's not red as in love and it's not white as in pure. And the frosted wedding cake of the ceiling ripped over the wine colored rug may look beautiful, but it's not what it appears to be. And the shrill sound of the telephone we're going to find out is an interruption by this vulgar woman Tom has in New York who doesn't even have the decency not to call during dinner. So there's no marital bliss here. Daisy's life aspiration for her daughter is one of those quotable moments that reveals that Daisy has become very cynical about her life, and it's gone on for a while. Let's read that part uh, in the book where we find out about Tom's affair. The telephone rang inside startlingly, and as Daisy shook her head decisively at Tom, the subject of the stables, in fact, all subjects vanished into air. Among the broken fragments of the last five minutes at table, I remember the candles being lit, again, pointlessly, and I was conscious of wanting to look squarely at everyone and yet to avoid all eyes. 
I couldn't guess what Daisy and Tom were thinking, but I doubt if even Miss Baker, who seemed to have mastered a certain hearty skepticism, was able utterly to put this fifth guest's shrill metallic urgency out of his mind. To a certain temperament, the situation might have seemed intriguing. My own instinct was to telephone immediately for the police. <laughs> the horses, needless to say, were not mentioned again. Tom and Miss Baker were several feet of twilight between them, strolled back into the library as if to a vigil besides a perfectly tangible body. While trying to look pleasantly interested and a little deaf, I followed Daisy around a chain of connecting verandas to the porch in front. In its deep gloom, we sat down side by side on a wicker settee. Daisy took her face in her hands as if feeling its lovely shape, and her face moved gradually out into the velvet dusk. I saw that turbulent emotions possessed her, so I asked what I thought would be some sedative questions about her little girl. We don't know each other very well, Nick, she said suddenly. Even if we are cousins, you didn't come to my wedding. I wasn't back from the war. Well, that's true. We've had a very bad time, Nick, and I'm pretty cynical about everything. Evidently, she had reason to be. I waited, but she didn't say any more, and after a moment I returned rather feebly to the subject of her daughter. I suppose she talks and eats and everything. Oh, yes, she looked at me absently. Listen, Nick, let me tell you what I said when she was born. Would you like to hear? Very much. It'll show you how I've gotten to feel about things. Well, she was less than an hour old, and Tom was God knows where. I woke up out of the ether with an utterly abandoned feeling and asked the nurse right away if it were a boy or a girl. She told me it was a girl, and so I turned my head away and wept. All right, I said. I'm glad it's a girl, and I hope she'll be a fool. That's the best thing a girl can be in this world, a beautiful little fool. <laughs> Isn't that... One of Anna's favorite lines. It really is. It's... And by the way, a uh, great job on the Daisy voice. <laughs> I know. It's horrible. This line is horrible. Beautiful, but be rich and dumb so you don't know that you're being made a fool of. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, a far cry from uh, the heavenly quality of light and clouds and air everywhere else. And uh, there's so much about how this is described as bright and uh, so much in like in terms of movement that doesn't make literal sense. I mean, how can the only completely stationary object in a room be an enormous couch? And how can the <laughs> girls be buoyed up by an anchored balloon? I know. It's just impressionistic. It's hazy. It's kind of literal. But we're given this visual illusion that we're in heaven and we're just floating on these clouds and, you know, the, the curtains are flopping and we shouldn't go unnoticed that the sounds are telling us something very differently than what we're seeing. Fitzgerald does a lot, especially when it comes to Daisy and we're talking about auditory imagery. Read the part where he describes what Daisy, well, I would say look like, but it, it's not what she looks like at all. We don't know that. It's what she sounds like. I looked back at my cousin, who began to ask me questions in her low, thrilling voice. That's what I was doing, by the way. My low, thrilling, yeah, thrilling voice. voice. <laughs> it was the kind of voice that the ear follows up and down, as if each speech is an arrangement of notes that will never be played again. Her face was sad and lovely with bright things in it, bright eyes and a bright, passionate mouth. But there was an excitement in her voice that men who care for her found difficult to forget. A singing compulsion, a whispered listen, a promise that she had done gay, exciting things just a while since, and that there were gay, exciting things hovering in the next hour. And then it goes on to talk about Tom, and that's probably the funniest part of the book. He's so arrogant, so racist so stupid he doesn't even realize that even daisy makes fun of that it's just a lot of funny subtle contextual humor so hopefully as you read it for yourself you can see it watch the colors watch the light watch the irony watch the humor and i know our time is coming to an end and there's more to say we didn't even get to talk about jordan but i guess we have to stop somewhere 
I didn't want to stop, though, before we get to the end of the chapter. So I'm going to skip to there because I want to get back to Gatsby, the guy with whose personality is this unbroken series of successful gestures, this person who has something gorgeous about him, some heightened sensitivity of the promises of life that we never actually see him actually describe. But anyway, when we see him or when Nick sees him, He can't see him. He just sees the silhouette of him and he sees what he's doing. And if we read it, what we'll see is that Gatsby is stretching out his arms toward the dark water. He's trembling. Nick looks in the direction of where he seems to be yearning and all Nick sees is a single green light. And yes, you guessed it. That's one more symbol. (laughs) (laughs) And that is where we will start next week. I think so. Well, thank you for listening. Um, I hope you've enjoyed our discussion of this great American novel. And if you have, please forward this episode to a friend so they can enjoy it too and we can grow. Uh, Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. If you aren't already, and stop by the chat and download a listening guide and go to our website, howtolovelitpodcast.com. We'll see you next week. Peace out. Peace out.